comparison with this motion, that of the train is so slow that it hardly counts. You cannot say that one of these ways of estimating your motion is more correct than the other. Each is perfectly correct as soon as the reference body is assigned. Now, just as you can estimate a fortune in different currencies without altering its relations to other fortunes, so you can estimate a body's motion by means of different reference bodies without altering its relations to other motions. And as physics is entirely concerned with relations, it must be possible to express all the laws of physics by referring all motions to any given body as the standard. Physics is intended to give information about what really occurs in the physical world, and not only about the private perceptions of separate observers. Physics must, therefore, be concerned with those features which a physical process has in common for all observers. This requires that the laws of phenomena should be the same, whether the phenomena are described as they appear to one observer or as they appear to another. This single principle is the generating motive of the whole theory of relativity. Now, what we have hitherto regarded as the spatial and temporal properties of physical occurrences are found to be in large part dependent upon the observer. Only a residue can be attributed to the occurrences in themselves, and only this residue can be involved in the formulation of any physical law which is to have a chance of being true. Einstein found ready to hand an instrument of pure mathematics called the theory of tensors, in terms of which to express laws embodying this residue and agreeing approximately with the old laws. Where the predictions of relativity theory differ from the old ones, they have hitherto proved more in accord with observation. If there were no reality in the physical world, but only a number of dreams dreamed by different people, we should not expect to find any laws connecting the dreams of one person with the dreams of another. It is the close connection between the perceptions of one person and the roughly simultaneous perceptions of another that makes us believe in a common external origin of the different related perceptions. Physics accounts both for the likenesses and for the differences between different people's perceptions of what we call the same occurrence. But in order to do this, it is first necessary for the physicist to find out just what are the likenesses. They are not quite those traditionally assumed, because neither space nor time separately can be taken as strictly objective. What is objective is a kind of mixture of the two, what we shall call space-time. Most of the curious things in the theory of relativity are connected with the velocity of light. The fact that light is transmitted with a definite velocity was first established by astronomical observations. Jupiter's moons are sometimes eclipsed by Jupiter, and it is easy to calculate the times when this ought to occur. It was found that when Jupiter was near the Earth, an eclipse of one of the moons would be observed a few minutes earlier than was expected, and when Jupiter was remote, a few minutes later than was expected. It was found that these deviations could all be accounted for by assuming that light has a certain velocity, so that what we observe to be happening in Jupiter really happened a little while ago, longer ago, when Jupiter is distant than when it is near. Just the same velocity of light was found to account for similar facts in regard to other parts of the solar system. It was therefore accepted that light in a vacuum always travels at a certain constant rate, almost exactly 300,000 kilometers per second. This same velocity is that of radio waves, which are like light waves, only longer, and of X-rays, like light waves, only shorter. It is also generally held nowadays to be the velocity with which gravitation is propagated. But as it became possible to make more accurate measurements, difficulties began to accumulate. The waves were, though the idea has now been dropped, supposed to be in a medium called the ether, and therefore their velocity ought to be relative to the ether. 
Now the ether clearly offered no resistance to the motions of the heavenly bodies, so it would seem natural to suppose that it did not share their various motions. If the earth had to push a lot of ether before it, like a ship pushes water before it, one would expect a resistance on the part of the ether. So the ether was thought to pass through bodies like air through a coarse sieve, only more so. Then the earth in its orbit must have a velocity relative to the ether. If you go for a circular walk on a windy day, you must be walking against the wind part of the way, whatever wind may be blowing. So with the earth, if you choose two days, six months apart, when the earth in its orbit is moving in exactly opposite directions, it must be moving against an ether wind on at least one of those days. Now, if there is an ether wind, it is clear that relative to an observer on the earth, light signals travel faster with the wind than across it, and faster across it than against it. This is what two experimenters called Michelson and Morley set out to test. They sent out light signals in two directions at right angles. Each was reflected from a mirror and came back to the start. If there were an ether wind, then one of the two light signals, waves in the ether, ought to have travelled to the mirror and back at a slower average rate than the other. Michelson and Molly's apparatus was quite accurate enough to have detected the expected difference of speed, or even a much smaller difference, but not the smallest difference could be observed. The result was a surprise, but careful repetitions made doubt impossible. The experiment was first made as long ago as 1881, but it was many years before it could be rightly interpreted. Equally, the supposition that the earth carries the neighbouring ether with it in its motion was found to be impossible for a number of reasons. Consequently, a logical deadlock seemed to have arisen. At first, physicists sought to extricate themselves by very arbitrary hypotheses, of which the most important was that of Fitzgerald, developed by Lorentz, and now known as the Lorentz Contraction Hypothesis. According to this, when a body is in motion, it becomes shortened in the direction of motion by a certain proportion depending upon its velocity. The amount of the contraction was to be just enough to account for the negative result of the Michelson-Morley experiment. The journey upstream and down again was to have been really a shorter journey than the one across the stream, and was to have been just so much shorter as would enable the slower light wave to traverse it in the same time. Of course, the shortening could never be detected by measurement, because our measuring rods would share it. This resembles the white knight's plan to dye one's whiskers green and always use so large a fan that they could not be seen. But the plan worked well enough. Later on, when Einstein propounded the special theory of relativity in 1905, it was found that the hypothesis was, in a certain sense, correct. That is to say, the supposed contraction is not a physical fact but a result of certain conventions of measurement. But I do not wish yet to set forth Einstein's solution to the puzzle. For the present, it is the nature of the puzzle itself that I want to make clear. On the face of it, the Michelson-Morley experiment showed that, relative to the Earth, the velocity of light is always the same in all directions. If a light signal is sent out from a body, that body will remain at the centre of the waves as they travel outwards, no matter how it may be moving. 